I, I want to say a few words before I get started. I'd like to thank everyone here and especially the organizers for having me come. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be able to, to speak to you. Um, can everyone hear okay? I, I, and I, I guess you can understand me through my thick Chinese accent. Okay, so, um, uh, well, now let's, let's start the film. Hope the technology works. Uh, sort of, yes. Well, my research into this area began here. I was a cameraman and I was asked to begin documenting in, in the Tibetan Plateau. This is a river that was once known as the Mother River. And it was known as the Mother River because all the different tribes in the area grew up around this area. It runs south of the Mongolian steppe and it eventually became the one tribe eventually emerged and they could cook really well. So this tribe became the dominant tribe. I think it was their food. And it is the birthplace of the Chinese race. It's called the Lus Plateau and it's called the Lus Plateau it's 640,000 square kilometers. It's approximately the size of France. It's called the Lus Plateau because of its geomorphology. This is the soil type. It's, it's a wind-borne sediment. It was created in the glaciers. When the glaciers moved, they crushed rocks, and it was deposited by wind over geologic time. And these deposits are really large. And in China, they're the largest Lus deposits in the world. So in this place, the Chinese race emerged. This was the center of power and affluence for the early Chinese dynasties. So if you dig around in this, in this Lus, you might find some interesting things. I don't know if he's going to, yes, perhaps. So the Han, the Qin, the Tang dynasties were based in this area. This was a place of tremendous uh, creativity. This is to the southwest in Sichuan. It's a fully functional forested ecosystem uh, with hydro hydrological function and biodiversity. This is to the northeast in outer Mongolia. It's a fully functional grassland ecosystem. There's a lot of evidence that the Chinese race emerged in a mixed forest grassland ecosystem. It must have been extremely nurturing because it gave birth to the largest ethnic group on the planet. There's evidence that humans and their ancestors have been there for a million and a half years, and it's generally considered to be the second place on Earth where human beings began to cultivate the soil. But as this amazing civilization was developing, they were laying the groundwork for their own destruction. Might want to raise that just a little. Um, in 1995, when the World Bank sent me there, I found a completely fundamentally degraded ecosystem. You could stand on a hilltop and look 360 degrees and there was virtually no life anywhere in this area. And I was stunned, I was, I was astonished because I'm ethnically Chinese, my father's Chinese, and to think that my ancestors came from a place that was this destroyed was something that I really needed to process. And I didn't really understand the, the science of, of what was, I was seeing here. So I needed to study. So I began to study and I found out quite a lot about what happened here historically. And it's certainly transgenerational. And it goes back a long time. So approximately 10,000 years ago, our ancestors began to farm in this area. And when they did that, they reduced biodiversity, which caused a reduction in biomass 
which then reduced the accumulation of organic matter in the soil. This altered gas exchange through photosynthesis, nutrient recycling through the decay of organic matter, and massively altered infiltration and retention of rainfall. It also caused a cycle of poverty and ecological destruction that was passed down from generation to generation. And as long as that development trajectory continues, or continued, it led and leads to ecosystem collapse. So I started to become fascinated by this process of biodiversity, biomass, and accumulation of organic matter. Now, I wasn't, if it stopped here, it would be quite a sad story, but the Chinese, I was sent there because the Chinese government, with the World Bank's uh, help, had decided they were going to restore this ruined area. Now, that seemed like a, a, an, a, a mission impossible, but I watched as they made GIS maps of every watershed in the region. They brought in enterprise software to reflect any intervention or investment throughout the, the investment chain, and they engaged the local population in participatory assessment mechanisms, which, which brought them in to understand what the government was trying to do and also to find out what they understood about their own environment and what their hopes for the future were. This gave a multi-dimensional outlook and they made some decisions. They decided that they were going to differentiate and designate ecological and economic land. This seems to be a crucial step which needs to be undertaken on a planetary scale. They said they made econometric evaluations. They said it's pointless to do agriculture in areas where it's not suitable. Those areas should be closed. They're more valuable for the ecosystem function that they provide. That is the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity in practice. Now, not everybody was convinced. They are not, he, he is not a scientist. And basically he's making an assumption that he can't give up any land without losing productivity. He's wrong. This is the map that you saw being made real. They've engaged the entire community in this activity. They're benefiting in three ways. They're getting paid for their labor. They're learning sustainable agricultural practices. And they're going to own the output from these fields. Because they will have land tenure. But the project area was 35,000 square kilometers. That's approximately the size of Belgium. So this is not simply about individual income and productivity. This is also not a project about individual actions. They infiltrated and retained rainfall through having small dams. They terraced, they, well they started by differentiating and designating ecological and economic land. Then they made small dams, they terraced, and they planted in both the ecological land and in the economic land. So there's a role for 
much higher levels and much greater understanding of agriculture, which is being promoted by organizations like the International Center for the Research into Agroforestry. Perennial multi-cropping.